Anyway, yes. Hey, it's Mike Brennan. We're back with another MI Tech TV. Uh, I have Matt Roush as my co-host back this week. Hey. And uh, so uh, also uh, we have uh, on the show lots of different folks, including my webmaster, M Millie Astale, uh, who hey is going to be talking about, I'll let me get it correct here, put my glasses back on here. Uh, it's going to be uh, the uh, you're going to be talking about conversion rate optimization. Is that correct? You got it. OK, cool. Uh, so let's start in then, Mary. Uh Let's uh, define that term. I mean, I'm pretty familiar with it because I work with you, but others may not be. I, you know, uh, guys, we, you know, I've been on your show multiple times. You know, we've talked about a lot of things, digital marketing and a variety of different ways. Um, what we're talking about today is nothing new in theory. Um, you know, the idea of why doesn't a website visitor convert into a lead or a sale is been, I mean, that, that question has been out there for years. It's, it, there's nothing new. I think what's changed I'd say in the last three years are the tools that are available to understand why it to, to, let me revisit the tools that are available to answer the question of why. So this process has become a discipline. It has become a science uh, because these new tools exist um, in the last three, well, let's just say three years to be safe. You know, you might be able to go back five years, but nonetheless, the, 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 the conversion rate optimization is about converting people on your website into a lead or a sale. If they don't convert, why are they not converting is the question that you have to answer. And my take on this, especially as we've built this um, discipline, this marketing process uh, into something professional in the last two years is that don't spend another dime on marketing or advertising for that matter um, until you fixed the problem on your website. Why mm. are they not becoming a lead? Why are they not... Uh, adding their name as, to your newsletter, why they're not contacting you on a form, why they're not calling you on the phone, why are they not making a sale, whatever the case, whatever the action is, whatever that, you know, that end result is that you're looking to get, get from these people that are visiting your website, let's stop the dollars on marketing until we've answered this question. Now, like I said, up until about the last two or three years, you know, you might have said, well, I've got a team that's doing this and my ad agency is doing this and so on and so forth. And yeah, believe me, I can go back 10 years ago and we were trying to answer the same question to, for a lot of our projects as well. But without the right tools, you don't have an answer. And so, yeah, you could go back 10 years ago and say, yep, we had Google Analytics, no problem, hey. You know what, we've been working with Google Analytics for a long time, but even Google Analytics has changed. I mean, we've had, uh, it has matured and evolved into so many different uh, elements uh, and capabilities that you needed this 10 years ago in order to answer the question. So when we talk about conversion rate options, we have to understand that in fact, it's matured and has turned into a science that businesses need to take more seriously. And let me just leap in because I know this answer and then I'll let you go, Matt. Uh, and, and you were mentioning to me, you, your company, uh, Smart Finds Marketing, has actually begun a 60-day campaign, I think it is, you said, uh, to really move yeah. this forward? Yeah, we've actually started back on June 1st. We were trying to kind of get the word out, so to speak, about, you know, businesses taking this more seriously. In other words, hey, stop your marketing and advertising for 90 days. Believe me, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and figure out if you can get your uh, conversions in line with what you're expecting for your business. And um, there's a variety of ways that you can measure this. Um, the basic is Google Analytics has a, something called a bounce rate, meaning somebody goes to one page of your website, whether they spend five seconds or five minutes on that page, it doesn't make a difference. If they don't go to a second page within your website, they're considered a bounce. So what we're saying in this case is um, if your bounce rate is, let's say, 30% or more, which most businesses are, then we need to figure out how to reduce that down to that 30 percentile level 
look at your calls to action, your design, your layout. What is it that you're asking people to do? Are you giving them a directive to go in a specific direction? So they go from the home page to an information page to a contact page. Or what is it that you want them to do? And there's a variety of ways to, to analyze that, understand it, implement it, do A-B testing, use artificial intelligent to tools to be able to track the results and understand what your, uh, your website visitor's journey is all about. Um, there's a variety of things that we can do nowadays. And I think that it's worth fixing the website before you spend more dollars on advertising. Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you is that's fine to ask that question, but how does one go about answering it? And, you know, how do you sort of quantify what those answers are? Right. So I think uh, you, you have to find a starting point. So the step number one is, you know, you do a 30 day analysis of what's going on within the website before you make any changes. Um, we collaborate with the client. Okay. Here's what we found. This is what we understand. Is this true? get their feedback about what's right, what's wrong. In that process, you also identify what are the key uh, conversion web pages. Now, within the website, there are certain web pages that they find most important that's going to generate a sale or a lead. And so, okay, let's take a look at those, analyze that, review that together with the client, go through that process. And once we understand what we're going to change, then we go into the implement, into the making the changes. Um, the changes are going to include adding certain tools to the website. So an artificial intelligence tool, A-B testing tools, and then be able to go from there to testing different scenarios out. Um, the testing process, which definitely goes, happens in the next 30 days, takes time, unfortunately. I mean, you got to gather data. You can't just base it on one more visitor or two more visitors. You need like, you know, 10, 20, 100 more visitors to figure out what's, you know, whether this is all heading in the right direction. And so based, then what you do is you take Google Analytics, you take Google Search Console, you take your AI tool uh, and its re reports. You take the A-B testing tool, which has separate reports, you combine all of this to understand what are we going, whether this is working or not. If it is, great. Let, now let's pile in a few more dollars into marketing, drive more traffic. Or the answer is, well, this isn't quite working to the level we want. Based on the results, what are the changes that should we make? And that's the process that you go through. Um, and it'll take a roughly 120 days or so to go from step one to step, you know, to the end of the process to get the website to be more effective. And so but we have uh, all the reports. Yeah. And so you uh, let's talk a little bit. I know you uh, you sent me some numbers. Uh, you're offering this service for a certain rate and certain things will happen. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, so what we're doing is to help uh, businesses kind of come up to speed on this. And I realize this is not going to be for all businesses. And believe me, that's that's OK, um, because this is a labor intensive process at the end of days. We, there are, you know, while we're using a AI tool and, a, and an AB testing tool at the end of the day, you have human beings having to develop creative, um, make changes to web pages, um, put, implement whatever if sands and butts are necessary to make this all happen. So we're, we're, we have a program that's $2,500 a month for four months, basically $10,000 to get the website working the way it should to generate more leads. And our recommendation is stop your additional, your marketing activities until we fix this. Now, if you're asking me, hey, if I stop my marketing, I'm not gonna get any website traffic. And that's not true. You got a whole bunch of traffic coming to your website from Google and it's free. So let's t take a look at what Google is sending us and use that, that those website visitors to work through the process of correcting the website. Maybe. And in most cases, this should be able to, um, you know, the, co the cost of what we're offering compared to the cost of what you're spending should either be one-to-one -one or we sh our, our program is probably gonna has helped save you money over those four months. Okay. 
Um, so, so is there a size uh, limit on businesses that you're looking to do this for? I mean, you look for very small, like individual type businesses up to, up to large businesses. What have, what have most of the client sizes been like for you? I mean, I, I, th I think you would agree that we're looking at mid to large co companies, right? I mean, in terms of revenue, I'm not talking about employee size or, um, you know, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm looking at revenue and I'm saying that, hey, uh, even a, you know, a 10 man operation, um, you know, generating, you know, let's say five, $10 million probably needs this. Um, especially when they're constantly looking for new leads, new sales, new everything. Um, it's going to be based on your revenue. And if you're looking at $5 million on up, then I think this program is probably ideal for you. Um, so I'm not going to go into whether the size of the business in terms of, um, um, if, in terms of the capacities or their employees and so on and so forth. Let's just say that let's, let's base it on their revenue. Five million or more should do the trick. Now, we've been talking a lot about, uh, well, you and I personally have been talking about working with auto dealers in the past. Is this something that would work, say, for an auto dealer? I mean, I for the, to answer your question, yes, absolutely, it would work. But here's my caveat. Most of the auto dealership websites have now been um, funneled into large companies that do auto dealership websites. And, um, you know, you got your dealer inspired and your Coxes and so on and so forth that are all involved in this. And theoretically, they, sh they are or should be doing this already. To what level they're doing is another story. Um, I, my guess is we're a little bit more detailed. We're probably a little bit more effective in that area. Uh, these guys are doing mass production CRO services across, you know, thousands of dealerships. Um, it depends on the dealership and whether, or the dealership group, that might be a better way to approach this to, to figure out whether or not, you know, they could use us. Um, however, my get, my gut feel is we're going to be in competition with their website developers that are these massive companies that are doing mass production, everything for them. Um, it may or may not work. I don't know. Um, I certainly wouldn't mind jumping into a car dealership program, uh, you know, to be able to. Uh, do our CRO program and really understand what's what's behind the nuts and bolts of this. But uh, like I said, in some cases, it may not be there. Matt? All right. So uh, what was the what was the development of this program like for you? What was sort of what what inspired you to uh, to create this program? I think the inspiration came from a couple of different sources. Number one is the fact that, <laughs> you know, we've been in business for 37 years. Um, we've had the internet group um, for roughly 30 years now, or yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and uh, we're constantly having to manage changes in technology and digital marketing and the internet, so on and so forth. We're constantly having to review data, analyze data, and more importantly, interpret data, and more importantly, doing all that across multiple data points, not just a single data point. So this research process is never ending. Um, and so we got to the point where, you know what, there, you know, we know what we're doing here, but do we have the tools to do it? And so the tools started to come to the market roughly about three years ago. Then it was a matter of testing all these tools. Do they work? Don't they work? Do, you know, are they part of hype or are they real? <laughs> you kind of have to go through that process for your client. Um, and from that process, we were able to develop a professional marketing uh, tool that I think will help businesses with what we call conversion rate optimization. All right, we're running low on time and I know you got another meeting coming up yourself. So folks, you got them all lathered up. They want to reach out to you. How do they do that? <laughs> uh, first of all, um, jump onto our website, smartfindsmarketing.com. Um, that's number one. Number two is uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn um, under Maylee Ostley. M-E-L-I-H, and my last name, Ostale, O, Z is in Zebra, T is in Tom, A-L-A-Y. Um, I got, I'm all over LinkedIn, so <laughs> should, shouldn't be hard to find me there. <laughs> yeah, you got like 20 or 30,000 followers on LinkedIn last I heard, right? Something at Ballpark? Uh, right. Actually, it's not that high. It's about 16,000 right now. 16, lots, well, lots of friends, lots of friends. Health, healthy number. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. 
All right, man. Well, appreciate you being on the show today. And as, of course, my disclaimer, he is my webmaster and social media guru. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought him on because he's the best, right? You know? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, guys. You guys have a good day. What's up? Thanks. Thanks. You too. All right. All right. Yeah, Lindsay Robillard. Robillard. I thought that was it, but gosh, you know, I wasn't Thank sure you. if there was a French pronunciation or what. So uh, there is, but I can't say it. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. anyway, what we do know <laughs> is that you're the Tech Town Fund Development Officer, and you're going to be joining us today to talk about the Toast of the Town event that's going to be later this month, I believe, right? Yes, thank you so much. We're really uh, excited to be here. And uh, Toast to the Town is September 30th. It's a live virtual benefit for Tech Town and a celebration of Detroit's entrepreneurs. So that's from 4 to 5 p.m. on, on Thursday, September 30th. I think it's virtual again, right? Yes, although we are very excited. We found a way to safely give all of our salute awardees live applause. So we'll have small gatherings, one at uh, Tech Town across the street at the Wayne State University's Industry Innovation Center and our satellite broadcast location, which we're really excited about, is the Southwest Detroit um, Ford Resource and Engagement Center. Hmm. Um, so we'll be, so we split the party so we could have it safely. Okay. All right. So um, for those who aren't familiar with Tech Town, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of the history and development of Tech Town, uh, where it's located and, uh, you know, what it's been up to lately. I, I covered it extensively back in the aughts, but uh, not so much lately. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, lots well, changed. So Tech Town is Detroit's entrepreneurship hub. We have our uh, co-working and um, office and lab space at 440 Burroughs which is in New Center, just a little bit south of the Fisher Building. And we are a close affiliate of Wayne State University, initially founded to help commercialize technology coming out of the university, which we still do and work in close partnership with them. And then in the early teens, we realized we could take, and I say we um, in the collective sense, so we could take the business principles we were helping tech startups put into place and apply them and help Detroit's small brick and mortar businesses. So since around 2012, we've had programs for both tech-based and neighborhood-based businesses in addition to our co-working space. And uh, since the pandemic, we've actually served more small businesses than ever before because the demand has just gone gone up exponentially and those are the stories you'll get to hear at toast of the town yeah let's talk a little bit about that how long has toast of the town been around and what's behind it what what what, what goes on with that yeah so in uh in a its previous iterations going back about six or seven years i think the first was seven years ago um toast of the town was a a big uh, basically entrepreneurial block party for detroit like anyone who was involved in like the startup ecosystem show up and, and have a great time. And the Salute Awards honor standouts in the business community, in tech, in small businesses. And we also have a Small Business Champion Award, which was last mm. year renamed in honor of uh, an incredible Detroit leader named Marlo Stoudemire and a in honor of his legacy of innovation and entrepreneurship and making sure that every Detroiter has access to opportunities. Um, so we're really excited how it's we've adapted. And, and frankly, I don't see, and I'm on the planning team because I'm the <laughs> development team. As, as a fundraiser, I don't see that we are gonna go back from having some kind of virtual completely free way to participate in Toast of the Town because tickets are free. We are gratefully accepting donations as a 501c3 um, charitable contributions of all sizes are how we're able to, to do our work. Um, but a donation isn't a barrier for participating in Toast of the Town since we've gone virtual and we really like that and want to preserve it in future iterations. Okay, so how do you decide who is uh, recognized at this event? Is there a judging panel or something like that? Or how does that work? 
It's really difficult. <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, so for the salute, the three salute awardees that are to members of the Tech Town community, we collect denominations from all across our staff and team, right? Who in the past year has taken all of the resources and tools at their disposal and also exemplifies our values of inclusivity and innovation and has done great things? So we collected all of those nominations and had an internal um, uh, evaluation and, and uh, uh, selection committee uh, comprised of our develop or our couple from development, our program team members in tech and neighborhood and education, and also our co-working community. Um, really excited that actually two of our nominees or our honorees this year are co-working members. Well, that's cool. As well as standout entrepreneurs. Can you uh, provide, uh, can you quickly name who are the, yes. the winners, as it were? Yes. So Javier Evelyn, who is the co-founder and CEO of Allergy, which is a really innovative company in the med tech sector. We have had them on our show. Oh, yeah. So uh, Javier's delightful. It was really exciting. He's had a, a standout year. He has not let the pandemic get in the way. Um, they received a patent for their auto injector that comes on a cell phone this year. And um, another honoree is Juan Carlos DeWiki Perez, who is also a co-working member with his company Featherstone, which is a, um, a marketing agency that is does dynamite work, has expanded quickly during the pandemic, and he's been volunteering as a member of Tech Town's Professional Services Network, giving free advice sessions to anyone and everyone for the past several years and has done some incredible work with our clients as building a business and really exemplifies how it takes a community to build something new and great. And our third honoree is Raquel Lozano, who owns El Popo Market on Bagley in Southwest Detroit. Mm. It was all set to open a, to, she saw a need for vegetarian, vegan, carry on go foods in, in her neighborhood and was all set to, to open that salad bar in March 2020. And she immediately knew she could turn to Tack Town for help pivoting, enrolled in our 313 Strong Small Business Coaching Program and took every single piece of advice um, for how she could kind of pivot and generate more revenue through a different new business stream of imported products from Mexico and has seen dramatic results over the past year. And we're, so we're really excited to highlight this great diversity of entrepreneurs that we work with at TechTown. Yeah, that's one of the things. It's called TechTown, but in reality, it's more of a Detroit-focused help group, some of which are technology, some of which are what we call mom-and-pop stores, that sort of thing, neighborhood stores. Um, I know before the mix was something 30 40% tech, and then the other part was a variety of things. I don't know if that's still where it is. Um, that is probably still pretty close to the right ratio. I'd have to go back and, and look at it again, but I think about two thirds, and that's not counting the co-working community, um, which is one of the benefits of, of locating your business at Tech Town is that um, you're a little more, you're possibly more keyed in to all of the advice and resources that we have on offer from workshops to the Ask an Expert program I mentioned. Um, so really any kind of business you can pop in Go to, go to techtowndetroit.org and, and sign up for a Tech Town strategy session with one of our strategists and get pointed in the right direction for how to build your business in Detroit. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, do you have numbers? Do you know how many folks total you have using Tech Town at this time? Um, the most recent crunch was uh, uh, over 1,700 in, the, in roughly the past year small businesses uh -huh. and helped by Tech Town. Um, I am about to ask my team to, to run the 2021 numbers um, because we've expanded services pretty dramatically uh, in response to, to the need. Well, it sounds like there might be uh, volunteer opportunities at Tech Town too. What kind of people are you looking for? Um, 
We, everything from um, experts in software development to legal support, um, I think there's still spots for marketing, um, human resources, um, and any kind of those, you know, what we find is that the entrepreneurs have the, their passion and knowledge for what they want to bring to the world. It's the, it's the ops, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't know how to, I've never written a job description before. What kind of insurance do I need? Um, and those sorts of regulations are the ones where we really are able to supplement through the professional services network um, and, and our, our team as well. We kind of, everyone helps everyone else's clients. There's no like divide between the neighborhood team and the tech team. If someone has the knowledge that a client needs, they, they get access to it. Yeah, speaking as an entrepreneur, entre- I can do it. It was one of those days, man. <laughs> entrepreneur myself, I mean, you come in knowing something because clearly you think you can start a business around that something. And for me, it was communications and news and that sort of stuff. But then I discovered all the stuff that I didn't know anything about. And so I tell everyone I've got an MBA from the School of Hard Knocks because I probably tried it and it didn't work. Uh, so, yeah, the idea of professionals and a team around you is now I've become a convert to I have for the last several years. I was a lone wolf for a long time. That was fine. But, you know, as you begin to expand and grow, then it doesn't work anymore. All you're doing is working 70 hour weeks, you know, and, and, you know, it gets counterproductive. So that's a great idea. Yeah. And that's how our tech uh, incubator program really works is helping build capacity around those core business areas for tech startups or post revenue. Okay. Right. Any any final questions there, Matthew? Well, I, I was just going to point out we're down to the last couple of minutes of the segment, so this is uh, the time where you get to do a shameless plug uh, for yeah. Tech Town and uh, tell people where to go for more information and what kind of opportunities that you uh, that you offer them. Yes, please go to TechTownDetroit.org. You can RSVP for Toast of the Town. Uh, it'll be the very first thing that you see. Uh, like I said, tickets are free. Donations are kindly accepted. Mm. And you can, um, it's, there's no better way to pack in an hour learning what Tech Town is and how we operate and how we can help you than watching Toast to the Town. Um, and if you have any questions, Lindsay at techtowndetroit.org, happy to field emails right and left. Lindsay, appreciate it. And now, uh, gosh, I would say man from Florida, but the last time you came in from Colorado. So I don't know, where are you today, Gary Erickson? I'm in Colorado. Ah, okay. All right. And it's it's, clear, like, it's a clear to... day and I could show you the mountains if I turn my camera around. Okay, okay we're about but... Colorado. Good morning. Yes. How are you guys? Afternoon. Sorry. Good, good. What... Well, I was just curious, whereabouts in Colorado are you? We're in the Broomfield, Colorado area, which is directly north of Denver, about 10 miles. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I, I, my wife and I have vacationed at Estes Park three times now. It's the only place we've ever been back to that many times. It's just gorgeous. It's beautiful up there, isn't it? It's, yeah. I, Estes Park is one of my favorites. We've, we've been going over to Steamboat, uh, too, which is mm-hmm. a further drive than, than uh, Estes Park from here, which is probably about 45 minutes to an hour. But uh, that's three hours away, but it's beautiful. Go through the mountains, you know, yep. see, see that it just, uh, I really like, uh, like it here. And I live in Florida on the uh, part of the year, as you probably know, and I have a view of the ocean and I'm not sure which one I like better. <laughs> well, you have to like move to California or someplace like that to get them both. Right. But who wants to be in California when it's burning up? <laughs> yeah. Well, and the smoke from California has even reached, the East Coast, I think. I don't know if Michigan has seen it, but we oh, we've seen, seen it, it a couple of yeah, we've seen it a couple of times. A lot of the smoke we're getting is from Canada, though. Oh, really? Okay, got it. Yep. So anyway, Gary's on the show not to talk about Colorado or Florida, but actually to talk about how you can increase your chances of getting considered when you apply online for a top CIO or CISO job. That's Chief Information Officer, Chief Information Security Officer. It's also going to talk about all the mistakes he sees people make during interviews. Uh, now, he was telling me when I invited him on the show that you, you pretty much filled all your jobs. You don't have a lot of jobs of begging right now, but you can tell people at least when those jobs do become available, what's the best way to get them and how not to blow it, right? Yeah. 
Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon. I'm sorry, it's uh, it's 1230 here, so it's it just turned afternoon. Um, it's it's interesting. We had a really, really, really strong start to uh, 2021, a, a number of opportunities. And uh, I was talking to somebody today, and it looks like the market has slowed down considerably. And I think it's due to the impact of uh, the Delta variant of COVID. It's created an uncertainty around uh, when people will start going back to the office. We've all been optimistic. We get vaccinated, everything will be fine. And then, um, then here comes this, this variant that's causing problems. So we've seen a slowdown. We still have some, let me describe if you real quickly, we still got some, some pretty good jobs out there. We're looking for a, a vice president of engineering uh, who understands warehouse management systems. Uh, and that can be working from anywhere. That's for a, a, a relatively small but very successful software as a service company that specializes in that space. Well, what state uh, is, I know you don't want to give up the name, but what state is that company in? Uh, well, they were, they were in uh, New York City, then they, they, they moved to Florida. Um, but then uh, with the pandemic, they decided everybody's going to work remotely. So they're everywhere. They They're got everywhere. In California. They got people in North Carolina, New York City, Atlanta, Sarasota, Florida, et cetera. So, so this person can work from anywhere. They don't have to be in that city. Is there a minimum number of years of experience that you're looking for? Well, they, they've got to let a team of, of 15 to 20 people in software development and have at least five years of experience in warehouse management systems. Okay. They don't have that. Our client uh, won't look. One of the founders of this company is looking to, to retire and he's looking for his replacement. Oh, so it's gotcha. a very, very good opportunity. Salary is good, uh, but the upside with stock is, is uh, could be quite significant. Hmm. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what you said you wanted to talk about here today, which was how to maximize your chances uh, when you're in a competitive position for one of these jobs. Uh, do you have, say, a top five or top 10 tips for people uh, when they're being considered for these positions? Well, let me t let me take my number one tip. OK, now this is it, And we get lots of complaints from people. They say, I apply for a job online and nobody gets back to me. Right. It, or I apply for a job and nobody gets back to me. The problem is today with 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 so many online capabilities for people finding uh, jobs that they end up with um, whoever is putting the job out there, they get hundreds, if not thousands of resumes for the job. So for the most part, they can just scan through them and right click or left quick click based on reading the first page of the resume. So um, my number one tip for people, if you're frustrated about not hearing back from people, don't apply for jobs that you're not qualified for. Only yeah. apply for, I mean, that seems really obvious, doesn't it, right? And yeah, you would think. You get a lot of people saying, but I know I can do the job. Okay, great. But they don't know you can do the job and they're going to find people who've already done the job. So if you have a choice between somebody that, that maybe has never done the job and somebody who's absolutely done the job, which one are you going to look at? So it's pretty obvious. So only apply for jobs that, that, that you're fit for. That's, that's the number one tip. Number two tip is on your resume at the very top of the resume, right under your short professional summary, you should put down qualifications for the position of whatever job you're applying for. So whoever's reading that resume can immediately sense why you're a fit for that. And then make sure your resume has details that support that information afterwards. Um, I can't emphasize that. We call that, that's an executive search partners innovation. We call that the in-resume cover letter. Don't send a cover letter. A lot of people say, I send a cover letter. And uh, nobody reads cover letters. So put it in your resume. Put that section four or five dot points, no more than two sentences each, right near the top of the resume. Hmm. And, and that's in large part because you were telling me that, you know, for a given job, you may have a thousand resumes you're looking at. So obviously you're moving through them very quickly, right? Yeah. We had one job where we had 1,600 people apply. Oh, my God. Uh, it was a little unusual. It was a chief information security position, security officer position, and we were looking in both Detroit and New York City. And so we had a lot of people applying from both. And you know, they're not they're not 800, they're 1,600 qualified 
CISOs out there applying for the job. So we probably cut it down to maybe 50 out of the 1600. I, I was going to ask you how many of those uh, 1600 didn't follow your number one rule? Fifteen hundred and fifty of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's that's our number one tip: is only apply for jobs that you're qualified for, and if you're qualified, put that at the top of your resume and tell tell the person who's reading the resume why you're a fit for it. And one of the hints that you can get about what you put there, it, it, you get them from two places: one, look at the job posting. What are they saying they're looking for? And two. If you're really qualified for the job, you ought to know what they're looking for, and you ought to know the key attributes that you have that you can present to them for that kind of position. So those use that at the top of the resume. Hmm. What else? Second thing is, all right. So let's say you you get you get a chance to interview for a position, right? The number one complaint I hear from people is that it's they've got several complaints, but when why did you reject that person? Well, they talk too much. <laughs> right? Now, everybody talks. I mean, I'm talking a lot right now. We're talking here, but everybody talks. Nobody wants the person who's interviewing you not to fully understand who you are. Right. So people tend to tend to say what they want to say. Then they say it again. And then they say it again, just like I'm doing. Um, would you like to know how to get around that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we suggest I was afraid to say anything, but yeah. Yeah, okay. I had us terrified there, but go ahead. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, 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 I've got two golden rules that, that I like to tell people about interviewing. The, the first one is the more the other person talks, the better you look. Hmm. And, and that's a little bit humorous. And um, what that really means is, is keep your answer short. So if somebody asks you a question, right? Give them an answer back that's short and to the point. Uh, that also means that you probably need to prepare ahead of time um, for, for the interviews. And, and um, uh, what I recommend to people do is they go back over the last 10 years of their career and they write down 10 accomplishments per year in a very specific format. And the format I recommend is one that a lot of people will recognize it because a lot of companies use this in internally. There's a, a way you can describe your accomplishments in a, a par or a star or a car or a SAR. They all mean the same thing. Describe the business problem you were working on, the actions you took, and the measurable results you achieved. All right. The other thing I tell people about an interview is remember that the interview is not about you. Hmm. And, and most people say, well, of course it's about me. Well, of course it's about you, but usually the interviewer, anytime I'm sure anybody who's, who's done any interviewing, Mike and Matt and anybody else, when you interview somebody, you know the questions you want to get through, all right, to find out something about that individual. So you can figure out whether you want to get, in, get into more detail with them. And usually during the first 20 minutes of an interview, the interviewer, is the one that ought to be leading the questions. And you as the interviewee need to keep your answers short and focused and on target. Hmm. And a lot of people will, will say, if, you know, okay, so I answered the question, how do I know that they heard me? Well, we'll get to that at the end of this, it, it, you know, my third or fourth tip that we're going to talk about here. How do we know that they actually heard you? But most of the time, if you answer with a good, solid answer to the question that's short and focused, if the interviewer wants to know more, they'll ask you. Yeah, when I was a beat reporter, essentially, and did investigative work, too, I would already know the answer to the question. I just wanted to hear what you were going to say. Uh, I don't have the luxury of putting that much time into stories anymore, or I can spend a week just prepping. But, yeah, I get what you're saying. So. Right. Um. So if mistake number one that people do is, is they don't, um, they talk too much, right? Uh, mistake number two is, is that uh, they don't know the company. You know, why, you know, one of the questions that almost everybody asks is, well, why are you interested in this company? All right. And, and you know, if you can't, if you can't give a detailed answer, if you haven't studied the company, then people know that maybe you're not a good candidate for the company. Maybe you're really not interested, or maybe you're just sort of 
passing the time of day with them right there. So, you know, know the company. Yeah, that always struck me as incredible that you would bother to take all the time to apply for a job and sit in an interview and not do at least several hours of research on on the company. I mean, why even bother at that point? You know, I mean, you're going to be spending a significant chunk of your life there. Don't you want to know pretty much everything as much as you can find out about it? I, then that's that's the way I always approached it. Yeah, so. I, I always think what I do when I find candidates, the first question I ask, I, I, I tell them about the company and I say, what questions do you have for me about this job? Because before we get into my questions about you, I want to make sure that this is something that you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the, um, let me go on to the next one. The next uh, mistake I think that people find in interviews is, is goes back to having pars and being able to answer questions. And that basically is that when you, when somebody asks you a question, you've got to be able to provide specific answers. <laughs> Excuse me. And I, I get uh, interviewers complaining to me, well, we couldn't pin him down. We couldn't get a straight answer. Right. Well, most of the time the person's qualified for the position. Uh, they just don't have good enough examples. So going back to my suggestion about creating 50 to 100 pars that you write down ahead of time and then you can pull it from your mind. I think that's a, it's one of the top things that you ought to be doing but before you interview is get prepared, know yourself, be able to provide specific examples, do them in a way that conveys the problem you were working on, the actions that you took and the results you achieved and try and do each of those in two sentences. Not each of the par, the P or the A or the R of the par, but do the entire par in two, two sentences. Hmm. Okay, what else? Boy, you do, you're wanting me to, okay, go through this whole thing. Um, one of the mentioned things I mentioned, I can go through my whole 12 steps for a highly successful job search, but they, I'm giving the key attributes about how to be successful in both looking for a job and, and in interviewing for a job. One of the things that people, at the end of an interview, you want to know how you did in that interview. Right. And, and you can't, usually can't say to the guy that's interviewing you, how did I do? <laughs> You know, what did you, what do you think of me? I mean, but you can ask a subtle question. You can ask two questions. I recommend the first question is what are the top four or five things you expect the person in this position to get done in the next year? Hmm, that's a great question. And what happens is if the person comes back and says, well, I, I think it should be, you should be, able, we're, we expect you to get this done and this done and this done. That allows you as the interviewer to remind the person that's interviewing you that you've already done all those things, that you can do them again. Or you can say, I've done, we talked about number one and number three and number five, but we didn't talk about number two. Let me give you an example of what I've done that, 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 in, you know, that is like what you're looking for me to get done in the next year, right? In this job, if you hire me. And you can give them a par. And they said, and then number five, that's another one. So that reinforces that you are qualified for the position. Now that doesn't get to the real question, how did I do in the interview? So the final question you ask is, um, how do you feel my qualifications fit the requirements of the position? And when you say my qualifications, you're not asking to say, what do you think about me? You're saying, what do you think about my background and experience? Do you think I have the background and experience to fit the position? And you're not asking the person to judge you at that point. How does my background and experience fit what, what the company is looking for in the position? So it makes it almost a third party kind of, uh, kind of event. So that's a really great, great question to ask at the end of the interview. And then if somebody says, well, I think you, I think your background, you're good here, here, and here, but you might be missing something here, that gives you a chance to answer that objection to them hiring you. And typically right. on these interviews, it's like they've already scaled it down to what, three to five people that they really like, and then, and then that's who they're interviewing, or how does that play out? It, usually what happens is the company will start with three to three, four or five different people and interview them. Oftentimes, and this is an interesting truth of the recruiting world, is oftentimes they won't take any of those candidates. All right. <laughs> because what they've discovered during the interview process is that that even though they've 
they think this is what they want as they go through the interview process they say well i really am looking for somebody who has these attributes plus i want them to also have these other attributes so frequently in a search we'll present up to about 15 people for a position all right so you know the first three to five may not be an exact fit if they're not we then go out and modify the search and interview candidates for other positions we try and short change that that uh, you know, to make it efficient for our clients and for us by creating a profile of the ideal candidate ahead of time and asking them to review it. But even when you go through that kind of detailed analysis of the position, um, we still get, you know, it's it's knowing by doing, it's prototyping in a lot of ways. You know, I prototype and I find what I'm missing. So how long, it, I mean, what's the typical duration of a search process for one of these high profile jobs, like a CISO for a good sized corporation? Could be six months, could be eight or nine months, mm -hmm. something wow. like that. It's, it, it take, part of the delay is, is you want to find good qualified candidates. So that takes two, three, four weeks to really get a good slate of candidates together. And then you go through the interview process and you know, you start with maybe the hiring manager and then, then the hiring manager wants you to interview with some of his peers or maybe some of the people on the, on the executive leadership team. And uh, they're not always available. So that might take another month, right? Uh, and then, then there's the process of, well, okay, I think this is one of the final two or three candidates that we want to interview. Now we got to take, take them through another series of interviews, which may take another month. Hmm. So, you know, we're talking four months right there just to get started. And that's just assuming that somewhere in that first group, you've had a good candidate. Interesting. And if you haven't, you just uh, rinse and restart again or something, right? Sometimes, yeah. We had, we've got a search we're doing right now that I was going to mention. We're looking for a manager of software engineering for a company up in uh, the Sterling Heights area. And um, we, we went through 10 candidates and then they decided to, to reconfigure the position. Hmm. entirely and so we started all over again that we've been working on that one for six months i think now was that based on a management review or based on the level of uh, candidates they got it's based upon um their th rethinking what they were looking for as we went through the search hmm. right and that it's not unusual for companies to do that they, these are critical positions and and you don't always get um, I, I, story. I, I did a search for a, uh, uh, I won't, I won't mention the company's name, but a large clothing manufacturer in the Southeast Michigan area for their CIO. And uh, it, you probably didn't know there was a large clothing manufacturer in the Southeast Michigan. Area. I did not know. All right. But a very large one, well-known. All right. And they were looking for a CIO and we went through the exact spec definition. I presented six candidates uh, and they started in interviewing these people with the rest of the executive team and they got a lot of objections. So they reconfigured the search. I presented six more candidates. They incorporated more of the executive team. They, they reconfigured the search again. I went through 25 candidates wow. for them before we finally got it right. And, and it was just that we, we couldn't get the executive leadership team on the same page. And I think that may be happening in the search here. I think I, it's good requirements. It's good that the company's going through this. It's good that they're getting alignment around this. But, but the prototyping phase, the, that's what I'm calling it, probably takes longer than it, than it ought to. But I'm not a, I, I respect what the companies go through. They don't want to get that wrong. Now, is there a difference between, let's say, a company that's uh, started by you know, a bunch of founders uh, and, uh, you know, they're looking for another real close partner versus a big corporation where, you know, it's publicly traded or whatever, or maybe not. But I mean, is, is there a difference there in, in working with those two types of companies or maybe more than two types? Yeah, family family owned or entrepreneurial owned companies uh, uh, tend to be um, was it not sure what the right word is. A little harder to to satisfy uh, hmm. because uh, they're they've been successful because of the way they've run their company up to that point. Whereas very large corporations have probably gone through that phase and and they're pretty well defined the roles of different people in the companies. So. If you're doing a CIO, you still want to get 
for a very large company. They know what they're looking for. They had one before. Uh, they're pretty much in alignment most of the time on this. If you're an entrepreneurial company, um, maybe it's a new position for you. Maybe you're looking for somebody to take on an expanded role. You've never had that one before and you're still trying to figure it out. Hmm. Makes sense. Okay. So, so what is the job market like right now for uh, these kinds of positions? Are there, you know, tons available, some available scarce, um, you know, we keep hearing about a labor shortage. Is there a labor shortage at this level or is that more at the line sort of employee level? You know, the, uh, we've, I've never seen a, 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 um, a shortage of people who are interested in senior level IT positions in the 18 years we've been in business. We, we always seem to find enough <coughs> candidates for those jobs. We, what we see is much more up and down in terms of jobs that are available for people. And usually it's when things start to slow down, companies slow down on the hiring process, as, as we're all aware of. And, I, and I'm sensing without fact, other than my own anecdotal experience and the input from a couple other people, that companies are, have slowed down their hiring process this fall. Usually, usually it picks back up at the beginning of September. We've not seen that pick up. Huh. And, and certainly uh, with the pandemic, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, a lot of these jobs now are, doesn't matter where you are, you, if you can do the job virtually, is that really the big trend now post, well, I can't say post pandemic, but so far in the pandemic. I would say that, um, that uh, 80 to 90% of the people who are used to working from home, and this is anecdotal again, I don't have a lot of facts. I'm just going off of our experience, <clears throat> like the working from home. 10 to 20% say, no, I want to get back to the office. Companies are, the, are not quite there yet. They're, you know, they've been very successful working from home, but they're not sure that this can continue forever. And so I'm seeing many, of, many if not all the searches we're doing are looking for people who are willing to come into the office at least uh, three or four days a month, up to two to three times a week. So that would preclude anybody that had to, living in Colorado and is working for a Detroit company then, right? That wouldn't be practical, right? Uh, it, it, we're seeing some of that, but it's it's. I still think people are going through the process of figuring this one out. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have somebody living in Colorado doing work for a company in Detroit or New York City, whatever. We've proven that, uh, but I think companies are still wondering how sustainable that is over the long run. Do people need to see each other around the water cooler? you know, yeah. on, on a regular basis to really socialize and get to know each other and trust each other and come up with ideas that maybe they can't come up with on a Slack meeting. Yeah. Well, I know I've read a lot of stories about the auto companies being much more uh, amenable to that idea, because then that means they can essentially recruit worldwide. And these folks, wherever they might be, these really talented folks don't have to come to the United States and deal with all that stuff, right? But are you seeing any of that? I mean, I'm sure you work with auto clients, right? Well, I think that's an interesting, um, you know, we, one of the shortage of workers we've had in the U.S. has been the limitation of H-1B visas. Right. Right. And then and then under the Trump administration, they were putting, they were making that even a bigger cutback with the with the theory that maybe we can encourage more development of homegrown talent. But I think the reality is that you can hire people from anywhere around the world for these jobs. And, and as long as they can communicate well, meaning English uh, language, you know, they can do the work from anywhere. I'm working with one company in California right now where they have people in Denver, they have people in Mountain View and they have people in Munich. And the time difference doesn't you know, really matter a lot or? Yeah, the time difference between Munich and Mountain View does, what is it, nine hour, 10 hour time difference uh, is, that does get in the way, but they seem to have worked it out. Hmm. Somebody has to be uh, staying late or sleeping early or whatever, right? But I mean, <laughs> we got to get together. I think though, part of, uh, I mean, one of the things I don't miss a whole lot about the newspaper life, but one of the things I do miss is what you just said is the camaraderie, get together for lunch, exchanging ideas. That because I do watching I the fist fights virtual, in the newsroom. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean I'm doing <laughs> eight or ten virtual. Well, I do three shows, and then I must have four or five, maybe six meetings a week that are virtual. 
And then I very, I mean, I can't remember the last time I've actually been face to face with some of these people. It's been a long time. So, well, I think, I think we're all still trying to figure out the face to face, but we all thought when we got vaccinated, you know, we were back to normal and then the Delta variant hit. And, you know, now it looks like there's, you need a third shot. Yeah, I mean, or something. And, yeah, and even yeah. that, you know, you you wonder because anyway, you're, well, you're, I, I you're know protecting it, I, I yourself. Gotta tell you, I got to tell you, Gary, I know in higher education, our students have voted with their feet. We offered the option of in-person or online or hybrid, and the vast, vast majority of, of them want to go back to the classroom. They want that camaraderie and that, that you know, in-person exchange and that sort of impromptu, you know, seeing each other's faces and everybody's body language and that kind of thing. They, they really want that. Um, you know, well, I, I, I think some know, businesses want it too. The sorority parties and the fraternity parties got to be part of that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, please, God, let them all be vaccinated and careful. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we won't go into that because I just had one of those fraternity parties over the weekend, but we won't go into that. So uh, <laughs> um, it wasn't like the old days, though. We were much tamer and older and slower wait, now. So Wait a second. You went to a fraternity party? Were you one of the chaperones? No. Um, <laughs> uh, I had some buddies in from out of town for the big game and, uh, you okay. know. We thought for a while we were 20, but by Sunday we realized we weren't. And every man, I'm still not fully recovered from that experience. Uh, and, but it was fun. There a movie about that called Old School or something like that. Yeah, that would be the movie Old School. So, <laughs> all right. Well, coming down towards the end now, we got everybody going. I got to reach out to Gary Erickson. What an expert! How do they do that? Well, you, you can contact me uh, at uh, you go to the, the best place to get contact information for us is go to our website execsearchpartners.com and you can find us there you can call me i'll give you my phone number is 248-470-9976 and my email address is on the website so either way um happy happy to what the thing i would recommend that people do though if they like the 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 ideas that that i presented here about you know how not to make mistakes in interviewing and how to apply online go to our website <clears throat> we've got a really good document i mean a really good document called 12 steps for a highly successful job search and we also have a sample resume download those and read those 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 are really good documents <laughs> 